was a long-standing tradition on the west coast of the South Island for the regional police force to turn a blind eye to the nation's liquor licensing laws. As long as the publican kept a tight ship, pulled the blinds and kept trouble in-house, the local copper saw nothing. Sure, the odd rogue publican needed to be pulled into line now and again, and a window dress prosecution issued, wet bus ticket sort of stuff. The local constabulary had good reason for this unwritten policy. The sparseness of the location meant a lone policeman had a long way to go to seek support in the form of the thin blue line. They relied on the locals to back them up on occasion. Their kids also went to the same school with the locals and the wife had friends in the community. Turning a blind eye to the after hours of boozing kept one in tow with the town you lived in, where the pub was often the centre of the community, a place where men folk, farmers, timber workers and miners predominantly could let off steam. Six o'clock closing may suit city folk with metropolitan working hours, not a miner exiting the underground at five dying for a cleansing ale. To employ a modern term, pubs were part of the West Coaster's DNA, and woe betides any interloper that was going to try and change that tradition. That interloper had a name and a title. Police Inspector C.W. Lopdell. This Wild West attitude to serving alcohol was going to end now he was in charge of Greymouth. In doing so, ignored protestations from even within his own force. A crackdown in pubs in the town wasn't going to go down well. By the way, I counted 19 pubs in and around Greymouth in 1932. I'm bound to have missed some though. So Lopdall sought to end this flagrant flaunting of the liquor laws and damn the torpedoes. Apart from pissing off the locals, there was also another nagging, more ominous reason why Lopdall's actions could backfire and end in catastrophe. 13 years earlier, a similar clamped down by a newcomer with a badge had seen an intimidatory bombing campaign undertaken, and that only ended when the police decided they had better things to do. In May of 1919, a homemade bomb was laid against the Greymouth House of Senior Sergeant Simpson that exploded in the wee smalls. The explosion was significant enough to damage his chimney and shatter his kitchen sink. Two months later, it was the turn of Constable Black, a device was left outside his front door, blasting a hole in it and breaking every window in the house. A hefty reward was issued, roughly 40000 New Zealand dollars in modern moolah. Despite this and an intense hunt for the perpetrator or perpetrators, no one was ever charged. The difficulty for investigators was explosives were readily available to any miner or farmer. The corner hardware shop sold them and sale records were sketchy at best. A stick of jelly had been a favourite with the impatient rogue fishermen. And if the obvious motive was to stem the early pub closures by one of the regulars, that suspect list would have included one and two men. Then add to this the already large pool of servicemen from the Western Front who could all concoct some sort of incendiary device blindfolded. And to clamp down on after hours boozing was therefore to tempt fate rekindled the passions of the 1919 bomber. From the title of the video, you already know by now this is what exactly happened. Lopdall had relit the fuse. The liquor raids began in town shortly after his tenure began, as did the bombings, starting with his house. At 1.30 in the morning of October the 5th, 1932, a bomb was lobbed onto the roof just above his kitchen and exploded, tearing off the iron roofing and devastating the entire kitchen. The bomber was back and he'd sent a warning shot across the bow of Lopdall and anyone else who wanted to challenge their way of life. Lopdall didn't back down and a similar public reward for information was issued like in 1919. That was also met with equal disdain from the community at large as before. If anyone knew who it was, they were keeping storm. Lopdall continued his crusade and was met with another bomb. This time it was lobbed onto the roof of the Greymouth Police Station. Due to a combination of heavy rain and, ex and the explosive detonating in the air, the damage was limited. It was only a matter of time though that someone would be injured or killed. 
This concern was borne out when a bomb went off in the New Zealand Railway sheds in the early morning of the 1st of November. The location was a central public one. The shed was made into matchsticks. It was also the route taken home by a senior sergeant, also a public thoroughfare. Then the bomber went quiet. He resurfaced two years later in 1934, just shortly before Lopdell was transferred to Hamilton. In his wake, he had left a heavy workload of publican and punter prosecutions for the courts to work through. By now, anyone caught after hours was also facing a fine if convicted. The bomber's venom was now directed towards the judiciary. In May of 1934, the Chief Magistrate Henry Morgan was in the crosshairs. And this was rather a silly road to go down. Up to this point, anyone appearing in front of the court on the West Coast in relation to provisions of the Liquor Act were receiving token fines, making the whole police crackdown exercise almost redundant from the go and a waste of peace resources. Lopdall had gone to an effort to bring this sentencing anomaly to the attention of the police commissioner. That got a zero gravitas. An identical historic modus was followed here in terms of the bomber. An explosive device was lobbed onto the victim's roof in the early hours. And this is it. The house. You'll notice Morgan's place is a rather large two-storied construction on a slope. Only this time Mr X had too much spinach for dinner that night and flung the bomb either too hard or skew with. So it either went over or to the side of the intended target's roof and landed on the neighbours taking out their skirting. Just weeks later, the last bomb was set off. A harbour board shed, which itself stored explosive. The intent here was not just to intimidate, but to make a decisive statement no one could ignore. Fortunately, the result was not the fireworks display the perpetrator had envisioned. A bit of a fizzer. So who did it? This one reads like a book on Jack the Ripper. Every suspect that crops up has merit, but nothing that gets them fully over the line. Unsurprisingly, that list includes a number of pub owners at the top. Ex-miner John Darwell from the Union Hotel. The Union bore the brunt of police attention and was the unofficial HQ for those who wanted to return to the status quo. Then there was Patrick Keating, owner of the Central, who was happy to tell the entire township he viewed the bomber as a Robin Hood-like character. That didn't go down too well with the now traumatised citizens. They wanted him caught. Then there was Richard Trembath, who seemed to possess information only the bomber would have knowledge of. Still, maybe he was merely close to the actual offender. Pub gossip said William Rickleton lit the fuse on the bomb number three and if one were to draw a line between the bomb locations his house was slap bang in the middle easy walking or running distance it was rickleton and a mate william sylvester roberts that had literally handed over the counter of the police station an unexploded bomb explaining they had found it in a sack lying on the ground on their way back from fishing they took a peek inside and lo and behold what did they find a crude bomb in a pet container. Details as follows. That wasn't sus enough. Rickleton was also drinking buddies with John Darwell at the Union. And it wasn't as if he was unfamiliar with law enforcement either. You have doubtless spotted the nature of the photo. It was taken from the New Zealand Police Gazette of June 1933. There is one huge issue pertaining to Rickleton being the bomber. In 1919, he was overseas serving in World War I for England. Similarly, was locked up at Her Majesty's pleasure in the clink at the same period of the first wave. His mate William Roberts wasn't in either the army or prison. He was in town the whole time, but that was hardly enough to convict. From the start, the police were faced with two obstacles that transcended their investigations. On one hand, they were inundated with scuttlebutt that led them nowhere. At the other end of this spectrum, an Italian mobster silence from the very people that were really in the knowledge. Add to the latter the aforementioned pub frequenters who wanted the police to cease the crackdown and could be said to all have a motive. 
Finding explosives around their houses and being as normal as locating a packet of rat poison. Who it was will never be known. The lead detective on the case, Holmes, came to this conclusion which has stood the test of time. There does not appear much likelihood of the matter ever being definitively cleared. If you like this story on Greymouth, of things from the coast, why not take a look at this little number? And just 10 miles away, there was a small gold mining town called No Town. Yep, N-O Town. On the very outskirts of this town, which no longer exists and now lives up to its moniker, New Zealand's largest armed um, robbery occurred. When I did the video, the value of the gold stolen was 1.6 million US dollars. And check it out, there's a link in the description below people. I would now like to personally thank my supporters from the West Coast for plonking their content on their respective community Facebook pages. The video of Gerald Cover, the Karamea Hermit. The Blake Town Beach Tragedy, and to mention a couple. And coasters are salt of the earth Kiwis who embrace their rich and interesting history. A small thing like putting one of my videos on social media makes a hell of a difference for a non-profit study room operation like my own. YouTube is a platform which tends to promote the big boys with subject matter directed to a bigger audience. Still, onwards and upwards. Bye for now.